So look, um, I, I've got to make an, a confession. I'm really here to bend your ears. I'm here to, I want to take you through um, a presentation that I gave in Cannes earlier in the year because I think it raises hugely important issues about effectiveness that I know will influence the kinds of case studies that come, come through. Um, I also want to bend Sue's ear particularly, um, and Vaz, I think Vaz and I are probably on the same page about this. But this is so important uh, that I really want to get it over to you. And as we go through it, I mean, it was written really for the um, Can Creative Effectiveness judges. I can promise you that they have ignored every single word I said. So I'm going to have a go at, at you guys and take you through what's going on. Because the real problem here is that creativity and effectiveness are going in t totally different directions at the moment in our industry. It's incredibly worrying. And that's the first time I'd seen the Audi case study, the Audi video. I admire it hugely. Um, there was a lot of talk of kind of 35-year journeys and, you know, brand metrics and moving things forward. The fact of the matter is that that kind of case study is becoming increasingly unfashionable in the world of creativity. Um, those are, I really cherish that case study. It's great, but I think you're all going to become increasingly influenced by what's going on in our crazy, crazy industry to go in a very different direction. At the moment, what we've seen... And this is just obviously the creatively awarded case studies in the IPA databank. They're at a 20-year a low. They're getting less and less effective relentlessly over time. And there's lots of different metrics. I will spare them. I will spare you them. There's lots of different really depressing metrics about how creatively awarded campaigns within the IPA databank have been falling, falling even faster than the non-creatively awarded ones. And we know you probably heard Les and I bang on endlessly about declining effectiveness generally in the data bank. And you'll also know that what we often blame it on is an obsession with short-termism. And this just makes that point quite strongly and explains, begins to explain anyway, but I'll give you more data in a minute to prove it, that why is it that creatively awarded campaigns seem to be particularly hemorrhaging effectiveness? Um, and the answer is, I will prove to you, is that the proportion of creatively awarded case studies that were short-term so this just measures the duration of the campaign and the period over which it was evaluated. But there's a whole host of objectives and metrics for evaluation that come with this. They're all about short-term metrics, short-term evaluations. It's all about a focus on short-term activation sales rather than long-term brand building. So these, these, these case studies are very light on, on brand. I don't tend to talk much about brand. It's all about the short-term sales we drove. Um, so there's been an explosion in that, uh, and although we may have restrained that growth in the IPA awards competition, because there is a growing understanding of the danger of this in the wide world at large, I think it's still exploding. Um, you've probably heard Les and I go on a lot about this, so I will very quickly go through our familiar sawtooth chart. I know you're, gonna, you're just going to groan when I put it up, but just to remind you of why short-termism is so destructive, and particularly why it's so, so destructive for creatively awarded campaigns. Let me just remind you, the two ways that we drive sales growth over time, the most productive way in the long term is through brand-built growth of the sort that Audi represents. If you have a clear idea of the brand you're building and you have executions that are consistent with that, but always imaginative and creative and different so we can create the excitement around it, you get this long-term growth. You know, these associations, brand associations, prime consumers ever more strongly to want to buy your brand grow over time. They're accumulative because they decay so slowly, um, as the Gaudi case study made very clear. But there's a second benefit to this, which I'll come back to afterwards, which is not just about driving growth. And when you're considering case studies, don't just look at the growth metrics, because I think that puts you in the kind of beginner's school. If you can look particularly at impact on pricing power, I think that's where the real strength comes. And there was much talk in the Audi case study about selling the right, premiumizing the brand, upselling people. That is profitability gold, and it should be effectiveness gold. And it will be in the IPA awards, even though it won't be anywhere else in the world because they're dumb schmucks. Okay. Uh, sorry, I withdraw that comment. I should never have said it. Uh, now, look, we've come, we all become hopelessly obsessed with this short-term sales activation model, particularly the creative awards judges um, at Cannes. Uh, the problem with these activation approaches, and these are behavioral prompts, rather like the Burger King thing that you saw. Get down to Burger King now in a clown suit because there's a free burger waiting for you. 
It's not going to run next week. It's not going to change your view of the brand the week after because you'll all have long forgotten it, probably. It only matters now. Now, they can drive huge spikes. If I give away free burgers, I promise you I'll give a, build a huge sales spike on, that, um, on your curve. To come back to something Vaz says, you know, you've really got to contextualize your, your results. You know, what did the advertising add over and above giving away free burgers? And I suspect very little in this case. It may have done. It may have done. But the point I'm going to make is a misuse of creativity. The other problem with that sales activation route, and I'm sure this is totally true of the Burger King thing, is it does nothing for pricing power. If anything, it probably undermines it. If I give away free burgers too often, we look at Pizza Express's troubles at the moment. It's giving away too much profit, too much margin through deals and offers and promotions. It's not smart in the long term. It only looks smart in the short term because we get some nice spikes. As you know, the six months, we talk about long term as being from six months on. The cusp point at which brand building starts to take over from short term sales activation, the dominant driver of growth, is about six months into the life of the campaign. And of course, millions of these goddamn new trendy new campaigns don't even run for six months. You know, they are a one week, if we're lucky, one month activation. They're never going to play the brand game because you don't change brand significantly over that period of time. Now, here's the problem for creativity, to, to finally make a point about this, is that actually creativity has very little to offer in the terms of sales activation. It makes little or no impact. And if you think about it, um, there's a lot of sense in that. If, if, I have, um, if I want to make you do something now, the last thing I want to do is to serve unfamiliar, creative, curved balls at you. I just want you to carry on with your inbuilt behavior. If you, you know, I just want to nudge you to make that purchase now, give you a reason to go and do it now. What I don't want to do is start trying to make you rethink your opinion of this brand. That's what you need to do for long-term growth. So creativity, and I've, we've been looking at this now for 10 years, has an immense impact on long-term growth. We talk about 10 to 1 multipliers on that level. Its impact is second to none. It's the single most important thing we can do to maximize effectiveness in the long term, but it is minimally effective in the short term. It really is. So it's a grotesque waste of creative firepower. The creative team that wrote that Burger King ad, I'm sure could have been doing fantastic work for that client for the remaining 364 days of the year but this kind of fig leaf of creativity around you know, Halloween or whatever it is. I, I just don't admire it. I'm sorry I'm, I'm being a miserable old curmudgeon. I don't admire it. I don't think it's good for creativity. It's certainly not good for effectiveness. And if we don't stop it, um, we're all in doo-doo. Um, and now look, I'm sure if Warren Buffett was here, and it would be lovely if he was, we'll never get him, I'm sure, to an IPO bed, but he has made the point for us, and he has criticized companies who have walked away from brand investment and taking a long-term view of their growth, because he's, to him, the single most important decision in evaluating a business is pricing power, not driving volume, not volume growth. It's about how much clout do you have at the pricing table in your categories. He knows that's what drives profits, and he's an investor, and so that's what matters to him. And it should matter to us all. So you please, please, please think about pricing power in any way you can in the um, evaluations you do. I promise you it will add enormously to your case studies if you can show any evidence of that. Um, you know this story. Why is short-termism, you know, what's the second level on this? Is it short-term is actually getting more and more destructive over time because the sweet spot in terms of how we should be balancing our budgets between long-term brand building and short-term sales activation is actually moving pro-brand. And the reason for this is that our sales activation tools, most of which these days are centered around use of big data and all the digital tools that come off the back of it, are getting more and more effective, more and more efficient over time. So that means actually that we need to spend less and less in those areas, and it is the brand side of things that we really need our attention. So this trend towards short-termism in creative awards is totally counter to the trend that is driving effectiveness in, in our data here. It is unbelievably dangerous. So resist that. You probably will get can candidate case studies coming across your desks in your agencies for case studies, you know, we got this great uplift. Please, 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 I don't want to undermine something Sue said earlier, please, please, please be prejudiced towards ones that can show long-term brand-built growth, because I think that's what we really need to do out here. If it is a short-term direct um, response case study, fair enough, let's submit it. They are good case studies. And there is a great one from last year, um, which I will come to later in my presentation. There is a role for these short-term activation case studies, but the world doesn't need too many more of them. 
what the world needs increasingly is good, long-running brand stories that show us the real, real, real power of advertising as opposed to generating a few little spikes. Uh, so you may have come across this. This is the um, creative efficiency multiple. And by the way, I think this is a great metric, um, which we rarely see in case studies. I've done analyses for clients I've worked with that looks at this efficiency uh, metric, which is how much market share growth to be drive per unit of investment measured as extra share of voice. You need a bit of data, quite a bit of data to do it, but I've done this with a client who had about four years of data. And what we were looking for was evidence that the campaign was working harder and harder. Now, ESOF, of course, varies all the time. You need to measure it over a period of a year to be reliable. But if you can show an interesting positive trend, that as your campaign developed, it not only worked well, but it worked harder, and its efficiency metric, bang for buck, market share growth per unit investment, improved over time. I think that's a pretty kick-ass metric to do. I very rarely ever see it. So that's all we're looking at here. This, is, this measures how much more efficient were the creatively awarded campaigns over the non-creatively awarded campaigns over time. And it is a pretty depressing story. So in the early days of this analysis, when we first did it, we had something like a you know, 13 to 1 ratio. For many years, it hovered around 10 to 1. We talked a lot about 10 to 1 multipliers. Everyone got very excited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And rightly so, too. And then in the last, really since 2008, was when everything started to change. And if you want to know more about what started to change in 2017, read uh, Orlando Wood's book. Uh, it's called Lemon. He's gone into the whole psychology of how the UK's advertising changed around about 2006, 2007. That is precisely the pattern we see in this data. There was a sudden shift in the, the level of effectiveness of advertising at precisely the point that Orlando identifies there was a shift in creative culture towards this sort of short-term mentality. I and mean, he talks a lot more about it. It's a fascinating book. I commend you to it. Um, uh, please read it. I get no, sale, no share of the sales, I promise you. It's just a really interesting read. So what we saw from about 2008, this is aggregated data over 12 years because I need big chunks of data to do this analysis. What we've seen is effectiveness falling off a cliff. In the latest period, we're down to somewhere just over three to one, but that is a 12-year aggregated chunk of data. I promise you, if I was able to cut it to just the most recent five or six years, you would see more or less a zero. It's that bad. We've got to the point now where creatively awarded campaigns bring little or no benefit uh, over and above non-creatively awarded campaigns. And sooner or later, the CFOs of our clients are going to spot what we've done, that we've screwed it all up, and they will no longer be convinced of the point of investing in creativity and all that sort of, you know, uh, um, non-working budget, as they will increasingly, I'm sure, come to see it, which is a term I hate because creativity is not non-working budget when it's done well, but it is in this new model of things. Okay, so look, enough of, enough of the build of the rant. I want to do two things in the, in the back half of my presentation. Firstly, just to prove to you that this is a big, big problem. So I've just divided the case. We're only looking at creatively awarded case studies, and we're only looking at the period post-2008 when this problem reared its ugly head so that we can be quite clear about what's going on. So what we're going to do, we've divided, the, we've divided OK studies into two halves, the top performers and the bottom performers. And normally when you do that, you get a bit of a difference, obviously, because you've, you've, you know, we're only using effectiveness metrics here. You expect to see a bit of a difference, but there is an enormous gulf. These are, this is a kind of tale of two halves. There's a bunch of campaigns out there, creatively awarded campaigns, that are doing incredibly well because they're doing some good stuff, which I will come to. And there's a whole bunch of them that are frankly doing more or less bugger all and because they're doing a lot of bad stuff, which I will come to. So let me just evidence the gulf between these two before I just quickly get into the, 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 the nitty-gritty of it all. So, and I mean, this is astonishing. I mean, this really, the point I'm going to make is that there are two halves. And if we go back 10 years ago, most creatively awarded campaigns were doing what the high performers do, the gold bar on that. They were of that sort. And there were very few of the sort that characterized low performance, which I'll come to. But... Uh, in the intervening 10 years, it has gradually shifted, and now around about half the creatively awarded campaigns in this data are essentially low performers, doing the wrong stuff. There is an eight times effectiveness difference between the two, which is, I mean, quite extraordinary. How often do you find two different kinds of campaigns? Oh, one's eight times as effective as the other. There is something seriously wrong with these. Five times as much market share growth they drive. They have more than twice as much pricing power. And if you conflate that growth, volume growth and pricing power, what you end up with is an extraordinary difference in terms of their ability to build profits. There's a 16 to 1 multiplier here in terms of what the good guys are doing 
in creatively awarded terms and the bad guys are doing in creatively awarded terms. And I can promise you Burger King, if it was in our database, would be in the right-hand side. I promise you, absolutely promise you. If you read the Burger King case study, as I have, uh, I don't think Baz would give it two minutes, frankly, in his judgment panel. I mean, Simon, Simon Cowell would be seething about this, and quite right, too. It's pretty risible. I am a miserable old curmudgeon. Um, so look, let's focus on the good side. So what does good practice um, for creative places look like? Let's just focus on what the real differences are between the good guys and the bad guys. And you already know a big part of this, because I've already talked about it. But let's just, let's just be clear that we have level terms, and, in, and indeed, this is an important part of any evaluation. So what I've done here is, of course, important if you're going to do a case study. Is it, about, um, is it about budget or the context of the brand? So here we're looking at the budget of high performers versus low performers. And the critical measure of budget, of course, is ESOV, difference between share of voice and share of market. That's what really drives growth. And you can see here that they were you know, pretty much about parity. So, you know, this is the great thing that came out of the Audi case studies, that when you have fantastically effective, highly creative advertising, you can drive growth when you're actually probably spending in ESOV terms less than your competitors. And you can see that the, the high performers actually had slightly negative ESOV. Despite their five or eight times effective misadvantage, they were actually spending less in ESOV terms. The low performers uh, slightly higher. Not a big difference. We can't explain this astonishing difference through budget, and we can't explain it through share their size. There was a small difference in the average size of those brands, not very great. And indeed, there, aren't, there isn't much of a difference between any of the other context um, uh, criteria that can influence effectiveness. If you've read effectiveness in context, bless you, um, uh, you'll know that there are lots of contexts that all influence um, effectiveness. I'll spare you the data. There are no big differences across any of those, innovation, so on and so forth. They're a pretty similar bunch, pretty similar bunch but they're fantastically differently effective. And the, um, obviously the, cue, the clues start to come when we look at short-termism, what essentially the case studies were short-term after sub-six-month results. Um, you can see low performers massively more likely to be um, uh, short-termist. Um, but what the problem with a short-term outlook is it's more than just the timescales over which you operate. It's the metrics and the objectives that you are chasing. And these low performers are, again, massively more likely to be going for short-term sales activation effects, the spikes. That's what they're looking for. Um, and when you do that, of course, you walk away from brand building. You start to become incredibly uninterested in those brand metrics that are all about long-term growth, you go the Burger King route, not the Audi route. Don't go there. Don't go there. Um, it also has an impact on how, of course, budgets are, are spent. Now, um, you can see the high performers are pro-brand. That is actually, over the period of time we're looking at here, more or less bang in line with the optimum from less than my analysis, whereas the low performers have strayed quite a bit away from that. And I can promise you, with those kinds of campaigns, we're under-reading activation because an awful lot of the activation is coming through short-term digital metrics that are probably not properly audited and we don't really know. So there's a great skew. It's not just about a short-term outlook. It's about chasing short-term metrics and it's about budget deployment to short-term activation media, the ones that we know drive activation. We'll look a bit more at that in a moment. Um, I was quite interested in this. About, we, we looked at targeting um, uh, because I thought it would be interesting to see how, um, uh, how broadly or narrowly they are targeted. And again, you see that this is classic bar and sharp. If you look at the low performers, they are much more likely to take a tightly targeted approach at decision makers, particularly decision makers that are known, probably existing purchasers. They are much more tightly targeted on people who they think are going to make the sale now. It's classic data-driven digital marketing. Let's use someone's data trail, find some way of serving our super creative message at them, Burger King message at them right now. So they're much more tightly targeted. The high performers are more likely to take a much more broadly targeted approach, which is to say that one of the great values of creativity is it creates these enormous halos. So let's, let's let everyone know what we're about, and then it becomes reinforcing. Now, the interesting thing build on that, I'm not showing you the data now, but both those two camps, the high and low performers, are more or less equally likely to use big data to drive their campaign. So this is not the question that the high or the low performers were, you know, kind of big data uh, freaks or, or fearful of it. They both used it more or less equally, but they used it for different ends. 
the low performers were much more likely to use big data for the targeting thing, this last minute activation targeting. You're about to buy a burger, I'm gonna chuck that video your way straight away. Whereas the high performers were much more likely to use big data for kind of insight and learning more about how to excite their, excite their consumers and, and uh, really reach them. I think again, you know, I banged on about this before, we are so obsessed with using big data for short-term sales activation, we've forgotten its enormous potential to teach us more about our brands and how to inspire them. So I would love there to be a case, case study that was proof of how you can use big data to build, uh, build brands. And there are one or two in the database that I've come across where, you know, where it um, unlocked insights and new learning and so forth, but focused on building brands rather than driving short-term sales. Uh, inevitably, there is a different impact on media. So what we found amongst the high performers is that they were um, much more likely to use the proven brand building media. And I've just pulled three um, out of the hatch here because these are the three most obvious ones. So yes, TV is there. You know, think box not sponsoring this, but even so linear TV, much more likely to feature as, as and remember the budgets are the same. We're not saying that high performers had huge budgets and therefore they're inevitably gonna put more money. They had very similar budgets. It's just they put more of it into TV than the low performers. They put more of it into out of doors. And they put more of it into online video, which again, we know if used properly can be a good brand, brand builder. Um, I'll, there's a long tail of things that they put less into. The most obvious one is non-video online, those classic, uh, you know, kind of activation pop-up type messages or whatever, short-term uh, response type things. They did less of that. They did it in balance is really what was coming out of this. They didn't overcommit to short-term stuff. I just want to um, show you what's going on with a particular UK client here, because I think Mars as an organization are fantastically good at creativity and they are fantastically good at effectiveness as a global organization. I think they are a really interesting one to study. So I'm just gonna look at three of their brands uh, very quickly and uh, just make a point about this dangerous fashion for creativity. So if you look at creative awards and what um, uh, the creative judges like, they love the Skittles case study. You know, rainbows, pride, one week of the year in any given city, I think it runs for about a month or so. It's a lovely activation. The case study is a nice example of how to prove the effectiveness of an activation. It's a well, very well argued, it's a silver award winner. I would argue that's probably as good as any short-term case study should be, but it's very well constructed and well argued. But it is all about the effectiveness of a short-term promotion. It's a lovely creative idea. We've got a pack with a rainbow on it. So we sacrificed the rainbow for, for Pride, Pride Week, whatever, Pride events. Um, very nice. I would, of course, being a miserable old curmudgeon, say this is a misuse of creativity. I would much, have seen, much sooner have seen this level of creative firepower applied for the remaining you know, 50, 51 weeks of the year. But that's me. Uh, the Maltesers case study. So this started, if you remember, as a, a kind of competition for free airtime on Channel 4, I think it was. Um, so it was a, a kind of one-off idea. Um, it, it, it got that free time, a million pounds of free airtime, I think. Um, but these guys rolled out, it's still running now, three years, three years later, I think. Mars realized that this was a purpose, I mean, come back to purpose again, this is a good example of you know, committing to purpose. They did it very well, they nailed that the understanding of how people with disabilities actually you know, cope with life and the kind of humor they have. Very brave ad, I think. They've built on it, they've rolled with it, and its effects have accumulated, and it's been a very nice campaign. They quite like that, creative judges. You know, it's purpose, it's, you know, it's doing some good stuff. We can tick a few of our trendy boxes on that. Um, not as much as Skittles, of course, which is super trendy, super hot sex. And creative judges have gone completely cold on, on Snickers now. Completely, they're, not, they're really not giving it any prizes or awards, despite the latest Elton John ad, which I think is, is fantastic. Why am I moaning on about this? Well, because if you look at the metrics in the case studies, the increasing returns are to the right and the increasing, cre the increasing creative awards are to the left. So we've got to fight back against this idea that, is, that you know, what we should all be doing is doing Skittles ads rather than um, uh, uh, Snickers or Maltesers ads. It's, it's hopeless, it really is hopeless. Anyway, uh, plea for sanity. I ended with a plea for sanity amongst the judges at Cannes. I can promise you it will have fallen on deaf ears. There's gonna be no sanity at their end. So this is a plea to you and to Sue and Baz and everyone else. 
We have to stop this slide to creative ineffectiveness. We above all have to stop encouraging what people refer to as disposable creativity. Massive creative firepower applied, for some, applied to something that's only going to appear for you know, a day, a week, a month, if we're lucky. Um, but also, not just disposable creativity, but tactical ideas that have no real connection with the strategic journey that that brand is trying to make. They don't build brands, so many of these. Um, but also the media usage that comes off the back of that, this overinvestment in short-term media that are about short-term effects. We need to get back to, and this is why I say, look, the world doesn't need too many more short-term tactical uh, activation evaluation. What we really want is brand building case studies. You, I'm sure, have read the lovely AA case study uh, from uh, Adam and Eve last, last time around, which showed the danger of short-termism and contrasted it with the rewards of long-termism. I think that is a fantastic case study. If there are any more like that out there, I promise I will bend every year on the, on the awards judges here to give it gold. You know, I will... I will do anything I can. If you can do another AA, that is fine. We need those case studies because we've got to fight back against this relentless, obsessive tide of short-termism that's out there driven by short-term digital metrics. So that's what we need to do. Strategic ideas in market long enough to transform brands. Brand metrics, show the link between brand metrics and growth, brand metrics and pricing power, all of those kinds of things. That's gold dust, that really is. Uh, and diff I would argue, I argue this, it's never going to happen because yours truly suggested it, but I think there are you know, increasing number of effectiveness awards competitions around the world, particularly in Australia, where they separate out long and short-term uh, evaluations. I think that should be happening in creative awards. I'll be long, long dead and buried when it does happen, I suspect. Um, but that's the way we should think, and I think that absolutely is how we should be thinking at it in the IPA. We should, we should be thinking about the difference between short-term and long-term evaluation. So we can judge them in their own context. We can be quite clear about the difference between the two, and so we can think differently about them. So here is a bunch of case studies that show you how to do short-term activation very well. Great, and I will be a supporter of that. So long as that doesn't, is never seen to be a substitute for brand building long-term cases. So I think we need, we need to separate this world out and understand um, how they work. Anyway, look, enough of a rant. Um, usual curmudgeonly uh, stuff from me. Thank you very much. <laughs>